I'm starting a minute early. My name is Owen Strand, and I'm the Provost and Research Professor of Theology at Grace Bible Theological Seminary in Conway, Arkansas. We have been called the Strip Mall Seminary on Twitter, so if it's on Twitter, it must be true. So uh, we're giving away a 1,000 Strip Mall Seminary t-shirts at our booth, UBTS booth, downstairs in the exhibit hall. So uh, check that out. Please do pick up a t-shirt, because otherwise it will be an interesting drive home with many boxes. It's a thrill to be here with you and do this breakout at G3 on Jesus the Judge. Let's pray as we begin. Father God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the excellency of Jesus Christ afresh in this session. I pray, Father, that we would never take Jesus lightly. I pray, Father, that our thoughts of him as the coming king, the returning king, would continually echo around our minds, and I pray that you would shape our lives accordingly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In 1975, one of the theologians associated with death of God theology, theological atheism, if you will, made this striking remark in assessing the death of God movement. Quote, the death of God in 1965 made the feminist theology of the 1970s possible as ideology, if not convincing as theology, because it removed the masculine aggressive principle from the Christian drama of redemption. End quotation. This is one of those rare moments when theologians, in this case a false teacher teaching that God had died, as indeed God had not died, was actively seeking to destroy Christianity, and he tipped his hand. The death of God, you see, as a movement in the 1960s into the 1970s, was not just about atheism and making it palatable. It was. But death of God theology was as much about advancing a worldview. And in that worldview, feminism overcame what we call complementarianism. Men leading in the home, the church, and in society. In order to advance feminism, though, you have to go against the Bible. And not just isolated texts of the Bible, you have to go against the meta-narrative of Scripture itself. Specifically, you also have to go against the aggressive principle of the drama of redemption, as this theologian named William Hamilton said. This, again, is a remarkable statement. Though William Hamilton does not name Jesus as the one who is in his sight, we can be assured that he has Jesus in his sight. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, the death of God theologians tried to remove the aggressive Jesus. You could almost say the warrior king, the greater David, from the biblical story. You see, the natural man hates Jesus. The natural man hates that Jesus is a divine warrior who comes to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. And with this, the natural man hates that Jesus has not laid down his sword, but is in fact very soon picking it up, and he will return with it in hand. Strangely, many modern evangelical churches, though not affirming death of God theology, have also taken different steps to embrace a softer form of feminism, including many that would say on paper that they are complementarian, but they are the kind of complementarian that want to tell you primarily what kind of complementarian they are not. Not what kind of complementarian doctrine they actually stand for. If you meet that kind of complementarian, know that they are in jeopardy in terms of their complementarianism. Jesus, in a softer frame, a kind of therapeutic evangelical framing, is no divine warrior. Ooh, that's the first to go. Jesus is a group counselor, a therapist, a life coach, a community organizer, a social justice leader, as Josh Price preached about powerfully this morning. But the scripture will allow no such modification of Jesus. Though we try to change him and edit him and tweak him and improve him and touch him up here and there, the scripture allows 
allows no such modifications. The scripture tells us exactly who Jesus is and precisely how aggressive he is. Look with me at Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And this will be our passage for this afternoon. I am not reading this passage in support of a deep dive into eschatology. There are going to be different views in a room of this size at a conference like this, and praise God for that. The new reformed movement that is being built right now is not ordered around uh, only one eschatological view, and I pray that we will have unity, though having some differences that, that are meaningful differences, and yet I pray we will have unity on texts like this. So don't think that I'm trying to subtly slip something in and reading this passage. Frankly, different camps come to this passage, and there's actually not a lot of agreement on precisely when this falls, and that may be fitting for us, because we can read this and simply enjoy it and profit from it without getting into a cage match over eschatology. Verse 9, hear the word of the Lord. When he, Christ, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. In our time together, limited time, this afternoon, we'll first survey this passage briefly, and then we will make seven applications of this passage and this doctrine, the justice of Jesus. As we begin with verse 9, the seals, as I said, are opened by the Lamb. The Lamb, in this picture in Revelation chapter 6, is in complete control of all that is occurring. There's a, a juxtaposition here because there is terrible suffering outlined here as the seals are opened by the Lamb. But all of this is overseen by God. And to quote G.K. Beale, there is a dual purpose in mind here. There is judgment on a wicked world, and yet there is also as this judgment is poured out on the world, refining fire for the church. So God is accomplishing two purposes at once. He is judging the world, and he is refining his people. Does this sound at all familiar with our situation today? The opening of the fifth seal introduces us somewhat surprisingly to a body of persecuted believers. They are, verse 9, under the altar. This is a beautiful picture, I believe, of protection under the altar, under the blood of Jesus Christ. To be under the blood and thus under the altar is in fact a bloody reality. But there is in this sacrificial positioning blood that is covering these martyrs even as they themselves have shed blood for the name of Jesus Christ. They have, verse 9, been slain. They have paid in blood for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The verse outlines exactly why they have been slain. It is a purposeful slaying. They have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They acted and spoke and lived as Christians. And the word, the world did not receive them as it should have. Instead, the world persecuted them, attacked them, ridiculed them, and ultimately killed them. This is not merely an arresting picture to us, however. This is a sign. To be a Christian is to fly in the face of the world. It is to go into the enemy's teeth. This is no trifling call, the call of Jesus Christ. This is not a call to become like the world, to enter into the school of Christ. To follow Christ is a call that you hear 
from the heavens to become like Christ, which sounds good on TVN, perhaps. And yet, there's another phrase that the Bible adds in different places. To become like Christ in His glory, in His death, or in His suffering. Philippians 3.10 This is precisely what has happened to these faithful saints. They have, they have become Christians and they have followed Christ and they followed Him all the way unto death. What has happened to these believers is their call from God, but they do not recognize their slaughter as a good thing. On the contrary, they cry out, shouting to Christ. Their cry to Him is utterly drenched in praise and thankfulness and honor. He is the sovereign Lord, according to them. He is holy and true. He is the one who always does what is right. And yet, the martyrs in the suffering church here, I think by extension, more Christians than just those who have been martyred are included in this picture, do not sing in this passage a song of gladness, do they? This is not a hymn that you get like in other chapters of the book of Revelation. No, in this chapter, Revelation 6, they roar, they cry out for justice. O oh, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? How long, O oh Lord? Echoes from Psalm 78 into the book of Revelation in this account. The cry of the psalmist hundreds of years prior, thousands of years prior, is still the cry of martyrs and the church. And it is a cry for judgment. Krines in the Greek. And not just judgment. Vengeance. Ecticate in the Greek. Straight and undiluted. How long before you will judge and avenge what? A theoretical death? No. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood? And then it stops there. Yes? No, it doesn't stop there. On those who dwell on the earth. This is a cry for justice. And it is specifically retributive. The saints who have died and gone into the rest of God, the, the, the time where they are not working uh, as they were when they were alive, but they have been received by God into His divine rest, nonetheless cry out specifically for retribution against those who have killed them. This is telling us something very important. The earth dwellers have killed the truth tellers. And the truth tellers, whenever this is occurring in the timeline of God, have not forgotten this injustice and this wickedness. They cry out to the Lamb who was slain to avenge them. The word for avenge here, ectocase, is used in Romans 12.19 to indicate what we do not take. We do not take vengeance when we are wronged. But it is not that vengeance disappears when you and I are wronged, when the church is mistreated and persecuted and Christians are killed as Christians are being killed now in our day. We have witnessed nothing less than a foreign policy disaster just some weeks ago in Afghanistan. It's hard to even make out what happened there. We won't try in this session. We have enough on the table to handle already. And yet suffice it to say that according to many reports from many different angles, a good number of Christians have died and are dying on behalf of their witness unto Christ. Friends, Whatever we're supposed to do in terms of fitting Revelation 6 into the timeline of eschatology, this is on the ground practical for us now. There may very well be people who just died in 2021 who are crying out in these terms to the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. So, you and I do not take vengeance, and yet someone does. Jesus takes vengeance. Every wrong, every abuse, every sinful act, every martyrdom, down to the last one, 
Jesus takes down in his book. He gets a pen and he takes every man down. And none are lost to him. None are lost to the mists of time. No slain Christian will be forgotten on the last day. Nothing the church has suffered in terms of even smaller persecution and indignity and mistreatment will be forgotten either. Nothing you are presently now enduring, nothing you will endure in days to come, and you will endure suffering in days to come. It surely appears, we all will, is forgotten by God. This passage makes it quite clear. These martyrs are given white robes in verse 11. They were each given a white robe. They are clothed by God, just as they have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So here they are clothed. They are pure. They are in rest. This word for rest that is used in verse 11 is the same Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew 11.28 to describe the Sabbath rest His people enter through faith in Him. Believer, do you know that we have Sabbath rest now? There's disagreement about how precisely to apply the Sabbath. Let that be said. And yet, whatever your precise position we have now entered into rest from our works. But we are not, like these ones, home. There are more to come. There are, verse 11, a number of fellow servants and their brothers, we read, who are yet to be slain. They are to be killed as these ones who cry out had been killed. There is a number in Revelation 6 that is not complete. It is the number of the martyrs. But it will be completed one day. People in this room may be a part of that number. People at G3 right now may be a part of that number. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed young men and young women being sent out by your church in days to come, may right now be a part of the number spoken of here. And it's not just a number that God uh, regretfully allows or permits. That's too weak. That language is too weak. It's a number that God has appointed. It's a number that the Father has set for His glory. It's not happening by accident. The number of the martyrs is appointed so that the Father would get ultimate glory and the witness would go out. A witness unto death. Christians, as I have said, disagree about much in Revelation. But we all agree. When we read this passage, we see the martyrs of the church crying out for justice. They recognize what the New Testament teaches in spades. Justice belongs to the Lord. Let us now proceed then. Let's now look at seven applications of this reality in our remaining time today. First, first application of this passage, taking it and then just squeezing it like an orange into your morning water. Do you do that? Is it just me? To try to apply it. Orange water is very good. Underrated, I might add, even. First, the cry for justice, first application, the cry for justice is everywhere around us. Is justice not the theme of 2021 and recent years? Is this not in every conversation? Is this not on countless television commercials? You can't watch ESPN now. You're trying to just let your brain rest after the end of the day without hearing numerous segments about justice. Everyone is talking about justice. In fact, there is very little justice in our world. We are justice starved in many ways. It is right to look around at the world and see that it has gone wrong. You can see this and not be regenerate in the least. It is right, furthermore, to crave justice. That is actually a right-functioning instinct of the human heart. Injustice is our world 
in many ways. And the natural man, unsaved, can understand this because according to Romans 2, 14 to 16, we all have a conscience. God has given us all an innate understanding of right and wrong. And so the unregenerate man knows that justice exists because his conscience is a living justice machine. He knows there's justice in the cosmos. Now, he does not abide by his conscience as he should, but nonetheless, in our natural state, we know justice exists. And we know that we should at some level do justice. And we know as well that justice is beyond us. And distantly, even further still, we all hear a bell ringing. The bell on the day that will summon all before the great white throne. And so justice isn't just something we want ourselves for us. We know distantly in our natural state because of our conscience that we are under justice. We don't know this fully. We don't know it to the fullest possible extent. This is why there is a need for gospel witness. This is why we need scripture. But we know this from what is called natural revelation or general revelation. The terms are synonymous. But justice is not ours. (laughs) We don't own justice. We think we do sometimes. And we don't define justice. We think we do. No, second application brothers and sisters. Justice is defined not by man, but by God. Justice is defined by God. Justice ultimately is not a great law code in the sky. It's not a book of secular ethics that Christianity happens to accord with. Justice is not determined by natural theology, distinct from natural revelation, where according to your fallen human mind, you think out a whole system of justice according to natural law, and then you build that, and poof! It happens to match up with Scripture in all sorts of places. No, justice for Christians is defined by God and God alone. Justice, like every truth, like every doctrine, is defined by the Bible. The Bible has the rights on justice. Just as it has the rights on all doctrine, it will define its doctrine. Thank you very much. The God of Scripture is the ground of justice. Many, many passages teach this from start to finish. The God of Scripture is just. See Isaiah 61, verse 8, as one example. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. Another passage where longing and justice are found together grammatically. In a world ruined by sin, the biblical God is just. This is two major means, very quickly. They're closely connected. First, God wants equality for all. Equality for all. This does not mean sameness of living conditions in a socialistic sense. Don't get confused. You might think that, based on our society, based on leftism, which is really the ideology of the West today and which is creeping into many churches, in part because many churches have told us that the gospel is neither left nor right, which is a gaping door through which leftism and many other ideologies like wokeness have walked through. No, God wants not secular equity for all. God wants equality for all, which means Equal access to opportunity and fair treatment. Equal access to opportunity and fair treatment. There's going to be a quiz later. Second, God exercises retribution against sin. Second major dimension of biblical justice. God holds evildoers to account. Both dimensions of biblical justice are vital and essential. This is because Sin wrongs God personally. It is creatures who commit sin against God, creatures made by God, creatures God owns. If you were to find your barcode on the back of your neck, you may have one very soon in actual form. You don't have one yet. But if you were to find the barcode of God's making, 
you, you would recognize that if you scanned it, it would show you in your little reader that God owns you because you are a creature. And you specifically are an image bearer. And so any sin that image bearers made by God for his glory commit, God takes personally. Sin is not sent out into the vortex to spin around in outer space. Sin offends a holy God personally. We see this in dramatic fashion, don't we? In Genesis chapter 3, where following the the eating of the forbidden fruit, a real historical fall, by a real historical Adam, with apologies to William Lane Craig, God shows up in the garden. Just as Satan assumed the form of a serpent and tempted the man and the woman, especially the woman, because the man wasn't leading his wife as he was called to, to eat the forbidden fruit from the one tree they weren't supposed to eat from. They have all forests. They have a garden forest that God has made that, that they are glad, they are invited to take the fruit of. And yet the one tree out of all of it that they're not supposed to eat from. The serpent tempts them to eat from, and they do. And it is a real historical fall by a real historical Adam, and then a real personal God shows up on the scene. And it is not mythological. And it is not mytho-history. And it is not metaphorical. And it is not figurative. And if you are completely confused by what I am saying, you can listen to my podcast, The Antithesis. And it may make some more sense. William Lane Craig just wrote a piece of first things in which he used all of those terms to describe Genesis 1 through 3 and Genesis 1 through 11 more broadly because he has abandoned original sin. Tragically, a man many of us respect over the years, and now he has abandoned other doctrines of sin as well. No, in the Bible, which is to be taken truthfully, in historical passages, which are to be taken truthfully, God takes sin personally. And God shows up in a garden, the Garden of Eden, and he sets up a law court right then and there. And that shows you the character and the nature of our God. God keeps covenant unlike man. Adam has just not kept covenant, but God does. God keeps the retributive part of covenant, the curses. Just as, praise God for you and me, he keeps the blessing part of covenant. He perseveres all his elect to the end. Praise God he keeps that part of the covenant as well. But we need to sharpen the picture still more. We need to double-click it in even more. Third, third application, the Bible's doctrine of justice is Jesus centered. It's not, in other words, simply about the divine. It is the character of God. Generally, it is. But specifically, the Bible narrows in to show us that justice has a name. Justice has a covenantal name. Who do the martyrs cry out to in Revelation 6? They cry out to the Lamb. They show us that the ultimate source of divine justice is none other than the Son of God sent by the Father. Just as we were talking about, God the Father does not leave sin unaddressed after the real historical fall in Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Ultimately, as the narrative goes on, he sends his Son in the New Testament period era to meet the terms of his holy character. The justice of God is seen at Calvary on the cross where sin is dealt with. Jesus is the one who in his life and ministry and teaching does right to everyone, fulfilling the first dimension of biblical justice. And Jesus is the one who drinks the cup of the Father's wrath on the cross, fulfilling the terms of the second dimension of biblical justice. You see, Jesus is not a pacifistic savior. Jesus is the divine warrior. Jesus is the greater David who was sent to rescue God's people. Do you know this? The Father sent a rescuer for you. No one else was coming for you. No one else was going to help you. Satan abandoned the man and the woman as soon as he got them to sink their teeth into the fruit. Friends abandon us. Causes abandon us. Sin abandons us. There is only one 
who comes for us, as in Ezekiel 16, when we are lying on the ground, choking on our own blood to die. And it is the divine warrior. Jesus has been sent, not just generically, Jesus has been sent on a rescue mission for you because Jesus is the only one who will fight for you against the devil. Jesus is the greater David. David goes out to fight Goliath, the enemies of God's people, uh, Goliath and the Philistines, when no one else will go out, just as Jesus takes the battlefield when no one else will go out. There is only one Savior appointed by God, and that Savior is fully sufficient. It's incredible. But in order to achieve victory over the devil and destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8, all you need is one man. But it will cost him everything he has. The serpent bruises his heel. The Son of God dies. Jesus Christ dies. But that's not the end of the story. As you, of course, know, unlike Satan, Jesus can take the evil designs of the devil and turn them. Satan cannot reverse what God decrees. Satan cannot counter-decree something, can he? Satan is a created being. Satan lives under the sovereignty of God's decrees, though a very powerful being, make no mistake, terribly powerful. And yet, God can use Satan's own devices to accomplish divine ends. God can use even the death of his son to free his people from the power of death. So, in sum, the cross, the cross is our doctrine of justice. If you, excuse me, if you go to find justice, you look to Jesus. Fourth, justice is a major concern for the people of God. Justice is a major concern for the people of God. I'm not choking myself up. I'm fighting allergies. <coughs> not exactly divine warrior status up here. The Christian is called in following Jesus to seek justice in this world. Micah 6 8. We are called to do justice, love kindness, and show mercy. In the New Testament, Matthew 5, 13 to 14, we are to be a salt and light people. So Christians thus, following Jesus, love justice and pursue justice. Until the last day, we have the following roles with regard to justice. You could take these down as sub-points. This isn't a Puritan sermon, but I do have sub-points for you. We are called to pray for justice. We are called, secondly, to support impartial justice in our world. We are called to support the creation of conditions of opportunity. We are called to call out genuine injustice and hold it to account. Justice is a major concern for us. We are not lured away by false visions of justice as the church, but never make the mistake of thinking that just because we look to the cross, we have nothing to say in the conversation on justice. We surely do. Fifth application, we must avoid and destroy false visions of justice. Not all justice is created equal. Today there is a utopian system that threatens to overtake biblical Justice. It is sometimes called social justice. Social justice, please note, is very different than biblical justice. Biblical justice, as I've been at pains to say, is impartial justice. By contrast, social justice is partial justice. In a courtroom, for example, practicing social justice, sentences are handed down in large part based upon your background and your oppressed status. So social justice, like wokeness, reads being white, male, Christian, straight, and wealthy 
as essentially evil, just as one example. And social justice seeks to tear down any structures that normalize such people and such circumstances. In such a worldview, the gospel is reworked, justice is remixed, and the end result is no justice at all. Social justice supports a leftist worldview. It supports pagan sexuality, an unbiblical definition of right and wrong, social anarchy rather than social order, the targeting of people based on their background, and more. And so Christians, brothers and sisters, must not buy into social justice. Part of what is so paradoxical about Christianity, in fact, is that you and I know that we will not get justice in this life. Much that we suffer, much that we go through, will not be avenged rightly in this life. That is why I say that social justice, by contrast, tempts us with utopianism. It tells us if we will follow it, the world will be made right. Sin will be overcome. We should be a people who fight for justice and fight against injustice, as you have heard me say in no uncertain terms. But the promise of social justice is a Christless social utopianism, and no Christian, no true believer, should fall prey to it. In becoming a Christian, you and I do not pick up a crown, do we? We pick up a cross. Matthew sixteen twenty four. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. Avoid false visions of justice. Sixth, the cry for vengeance in Revelation 6 goes against modern evangelical pacifism. The cry for justice goes against the spirit of our age. In this passage, the wronged martyrs do not cry out for mercy in this particular place. They cry out, for, for vengeance. Vengeance is not something the modern evangelical mind and heart understands. Ours is an evangelical movement that seems calibrated along the lines of niceness. It is calibrated to give no offense. It has a place for love, but not much place for wrath. It is eager to say it affirms doctrines, but it doesn't really want to tell you much about the doctrines it affirms, at least the ones that are challenged by our world. It gives absolutely no challenge of any kind, for example, in many instances, to modern secular government. At the moment when, in our American lifetimes, our government is acting unjustly to the church, resembling England in the Puritan persecutions of the 1660s, much of the modern church, including the Reformed church, pretends that the great ejection never happened. Have you read a piece on what happened to the Puritans in the great ejection? Has it been on the massive blogs that we're all supposed to be reading? Have there been conferences on the great ejection? Have there been sessions and videos one after another on how the Puritans handled governmental persecution? Or have you been told that you are simply to Mind your manners, be nice, and love your neighbor in a very prescribed way. We should love our neighbor, but love of neighbor does not mean necessarily doing anything the state says to do. Loving your neighbor means loving God, standing on God's truth, and then acting rightly such that you can show grace and truth to all those around you. You would never know these things, though, by many of our discussions. We should submit to government as much as we possibly can. But the Bible itself gives us limits to that. Daniel does not submit in Babylon. In, in Matthew 2, for example, Herod gives the wise men a command to come back and tell him about this king that he's hearing about because he wants to slaughter that king. And God himself, in a dream, drives the wise men away such that they do not obey what Herod said. Just because a secular ruler says to do something does not mean you do it. You try as much as you can as a Christian, Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. But there will be limits. If the Nazis knock on your door and tell you uh, to give up any Jews that you know may be in hiding on your block in your neighborhood. You do not follow that. You do not submit to that. Now, am I giving you an, an extreme example to try to illustrate the principle? Yes, I am. 
There, there is a lot of gray area here. Nonetheless, we are in an era when there frankly is just not a lot of clear, hard thinking about tough questions. Evangelicals are slipping. Reformed churches are slipping. And one profound area of slippage is our doctrine of judgment. The evangelical church is moving fast to abandon divine judgment, or at the very least, to make it as soft as it can. But what is at play in Revelation chapter 6? The martyrs slain for the word and the witness of Christ cry out. They cry out for vengeance. It's in the Greek. And it is vengeance pure and undiluted vengeance that they shall have. Seventh and finally, as we wrap up this breakout session, we must preach divine justice. We must preach it. It is both alarming to unbelievers and comforting to believers. And divine justice as a doctrine is calibrated to alarm unbelievers. That is what it is supposed to do. Who told us that we were supposed to make unbelievers feel comfortable? We're not. We're supposed to, by God's grace, in a spirit of love, wake them up. Do you remember the first great awakening? Do you remember that term, awaken, and how significant it was? What was the doctrine that jarred so many loose in that period, alongside justification by faith alone, the doctrine of divine judgment? Because you see, God uses this doctrine to wake up those who are slumbering, those who think that it is a small thing to be ruled by a sovereign God and fall into his hands. When it is the most terrifying reality, there is. You should be preaching judgment. You should not only be preaching judgment if you are a pastor, an elder. You should have as your major theme in your ministry God's grace just like it was for Edwards, as one example. And yet, the minor theme in your ministry, driving people to the grace of God, should be divine judgment. But it's not only unbelievers that need this doctrine. It's believers as well. People in counseling, people facing life struggles, people pondering life after death who have no hope right now, people who have been locked down and locked down and locked down some more, need to hear that God is going to make the world right. One of our strongest apologetics in the Christian faith is our doctrine of justice. You haven't been taught that. You may not have been told that, but it is true nonetheless. The doctrine of divine judgment is not a defeater for Christianity that nonetheless you and I should heroically keep preaching just because. No. The doctrine of divine justice is a comfort to those who have been wronged. And the doctrine of divine justice is an awakening word to those who sleep. And the doctrine of divine justice shows us that the character of God holds steady when all other personal characters crumble. God keeps his promises. The truth is this. God has appointed a day. Here, Acts 17, 31, speaking of God the Father, he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance, Paul says, to all by raising him from the dead. Let's just track this super fast. The Father has set a day. On that day, he will judge the world by Christ. Christ is not the one that God has worked with and workshopped things through and allowed to be in this role of judge. What has the Father done, according to your Bible? He has appointed this man. He has appointed this man to judge the world in righteousness. And he has given guarantee that this will occur by raising this man, the Father raising the Son from the dead. This is what a perfect divine mind, this is what the Father's divine will has appointed. What this passage is teaching us is this, as we warm to a conclusion. 
We will have justice. You will have justice. The martyrs will have justice. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to warn all you can. What did Edwards preach in sinners in the hands of an angry God? Let everyone that is yet out of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women or middle-aged or young people or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence. This acceptable year of the Lord that is a day of such great favor to come will doubtless be a day as of remarkable vengeance to others. And his conclusion, a hair-raising conclusion, does anyone still preach like this? Are we allowed to preach like this? We must preach like this. Therefore... Let everyone that is out of Christ now awake and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over great part of this congregation. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape for your lives. Don't look behind you. Escape to the mountain lest you be consumed. In conclusion... I pray this session, humble little session, a breakout, alarms the comfortable and comforts the alarmed. Unbelievers must stop sleeping and drifting Christians must snap to attention. Now is the day of repentance and believers need tremendous encouragement in these evil days when Caesar really is ascendant once more and against us and common grace is diminishing by the hour. This doctrine that we have covered here is tremendously encouraging and uplifting for you as a believer. God makes all things right. God puts it all back together. Every wrong thing will be undone. Every sad story will come untrue. You do not and will not have perfect justice now. Beware utopianism. It pulls at all of us. Beware it. Flee it. Speak against it. Drive it out of your church by the grace of God, speaking the truth in love. But know this. Justice is coming. No, 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 no. Jesus is coming. The warrior king is coming. The drums are pounding. The angels prepare for vengeance at this moment. The horses wear their saddles. The trumpeter is polishing brass this minute. The armies of, a, the armies of heaven are assembling. The warrior king is getting ready draped in glory. Even now, the martyrs cry, How long, O Lord? And the answer comes, clear as a ringing bell, from Scripture, from Revelation 6, from the whole counsel of God. Soon. Let's pray. Father God, we live in such evil and unjust days. I pray that you would use your word, not my words, but your word, to strengthen and help us and encourage us in these hard days. Help us to bear up under suffering. Help us to take it like Christ took it and know that none of this is escaping your notice and your attention. And know that even if we or our loved ones or a church member die, they are received into glory that very minute and help us to stop living so as not to die. Help us to start living in 2021 as an act of witness and glorification to live for your glory and to not fear man and to not fear death. Father, help us to say in the power of Christ, by the power of the indwelling spirit, I do not fear death. Because Jesus has won the victory. Jesus has gone into the camp. Jesus has washed our sins away. And Jesus is coming back soon and very soon. We pray all this in the magnificent and undefeated name of Jesus, our King. Amen. God bless you.